Well, the story of the Battle of Stones River really begins in the summer of 1862 when the Confederacy launches invasions of both Maryland and Kentucky. Uh, as both of those invasions are turned back at the battles of Antietam in Maryland and uh, Perryville in Kentucky, um, still it kind of set the Union war effort back pretty badly and led to a kind of a political backlash and it led President Abraham Lincoln really needing a victory sometime before the end of the year of 1862. The end of December sees a lot of activity. You've got uh, the big army, the Potomac in Virginia, will go out and fight a battle at Fredericksburg. Uh, over along the Mississippi River, you've got the uh, Army of the Tennessee under General Grant will fight a, a battle at Chickasaw Bluffs outside of Vicksburg. And that leaves just the Army of the Cumberland with its new commander, William S. Rosecrans, about 43,000 men strong. When they move out of Nashville on the day after Christmas, 1862, they are the only army that can get Lincoln the victory to kind of turn around morale in the North and give him that victory to support the Emancipation Proclamation. The Union Army takes about four days to get here, it takes us about a half hour to an hour by car, but they were fighting off Confederate cavalry and Mother Nature. When they finally arrive here on the evening of December 30th, 1862, they'll stretch in lines from the Stones River to the north, running to the south for nearly three miles. Uh, the Confederates are in lines roughly parallel to them with their backs to the city of Murfreesboro. And the two generals, General Braxton Bragg, who commands the Confederate Army of Tennessee, and General William Rosecrans, commanding the Union Army, will sit down and make their plans of attack. And while those two generals are coming up with those plans, the men are out here in the mud trying to get what sleep they can. The Union Army, and nor the Confederates, in fact, there are no tents or anything like that. They're all just out in lines waiting for the coming fight the next day. And during the evening, the military bands of both sides start trying to raise men's spirits by playing some music. And then somewhere around 10 o'clock, just before the call for lights out where everything would get quiet, one of the bands, and nobody knows who, struck up the tune Home Sweet Home. And the story goes that that song started to get picked up by every band up and down the three mile long line. And even thousands of the men began to raise their voices in song. And then when it all came to a close, you really didn't need a bugle call to make it quiet on the battlefield because I bet you you could have heard a pin drop because every one of those 81,000 soldiers is now contemplating home sweet home and the fact that it's quite obvious some of them are not going to make it. Well, when the day dawns on December 31st, 1862, Rosecrans's plan begins to start. He intends to cross the Stones River at McFadden's Ford and move down the east bank of the river into Murfreesboro to cut off the Confederates. But while that's happening, General Bragg all through the night has been moving his troops to the south so that his lines overlap the right end of the enemy's line. And his orders are a lot simple. When the sun comes up, attack. And they do. And the Confederates will come storming across the fields about 6, 6.30 in the morning. There they will find Union soldiers that have gotten up from a long, cold, freezing night and finally have permission to build fires and they're busy boiling their coffee and making their breakfast when almost 11,000 Confederate soldiers come smashing into and around their lines. The Confederates blast through Richard Johnson's rightmost division of the Union Army. Within about an hour, that entire unit is either dead, wounded, running for their lives, or captured. The noise of battle was terrible. Southern boys advancing through a cotton field stuffed their ears with the white fibers as ear protection. Oscar Penny. The right end of the Union line is ruptured. And it looks like the Confederates are going to win this victory. The problem for the Confederates is this whole attack relies on speed and momentum. They have to get around the end of that line and break every unit they hit as they go forward and keep that momentum going. And the problem for the Confederates is the terrain, all the woods, the broken rocks, and resistance from pockets of Union soldiers, 50 here, a couple thousand there, begins to slow things down. Nevertheless, the Confederates continue to drive the Union forces all the way up to the Wilkinson Pike, inflicting devastating casualties on their enemy. There, though, Philip Sheridan and James Negley, two other division commanders in the Union Army, 
have been putting up a pretty stubborn defense. Sheridan has been giving ground grudgingly, turning his lines ever so slightly, step by step, to keep the Confederates from getting around the right end, until finally they form a V, with Sheridan facing directly to the south across the Wilkinson Pike, and Negley perpendicular to him along McFadden Lane. That's about 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, those two units, about five Union brigades, will then, for the next two hours, tangle with nearly half the Confederate Army in the trees and the fields and the big limestone outcroppings. And they will beat back the attacks of nearly nine Confederate brigades. They're outnumbered more than two to one until about noon. And finally, a concerted Confederate effort will drive first Sheridan's men away and then nearly trap some of Negley's men in those big boulders that seemed like such a great place to hide and protect yourself by fighting. Well, they now become a death trap as those men try to work their way out. And the place later does actually become called the slaughter pen for the terrible losses that both sides would suffer there. And so it seems that the Union is still losing. If you're following this battle from the beginning to end, by the time Sheridan and Negley are driven off of the field, that's half the Union army that has been beaten into retreat. Confederate troops spent several hours trying to break through the slaughter pen giving General Rosecrans time to form a new line of defense along the Nashville Pike. While the fighting raged, Colonel William B. Hazen and his brigade beat back wave after wave of Confederate attacks across the deadly space known as Hell's Half Acre. Hazen's stand anchored a two-mile long line of Union infantry and massed of artillery defending the Nashville Pike. Confederate charges surged towards all afternoon, only to be bloodily repulsed by the deadly fire of dozens of cannons and thousands of muskets. By day's end, the Union would still be down, but not defeated. The enemy has yielded his strong position and is falling back. We occupy the whole field and shall follow him. God has granted us a happy new year. General Braxton Bragg. Bragg makes no preparations for the coming day, January 1st. And New Year's Day dawns and he's stunned that the enemy is still there. No attack takes place. Rosecrans and Bragg, they, form, they call a truce. The men go out, take care of the wounded as best they can bury some of the dead, although there are thousands of soldiers that lie well to the south of the Confederate lines. They will begin to prepare for, obviously both sides are going to stay, and so they're gonna prepare for a new renewal of the fight on January 2nd. Well, during January 1st and even the evening of the 31st, both armies had started to dig in, so continuing to fight here along the Nashville Pike was gonna be a tough row to hoe for anybody. Bragg actually turns his attention on January 2nd to where a Union force has crossed the river during the afternoon of January 1st and taken up a fortified position on the high ground overlooking McFadden's Ford. He orders John Breckinridge, who was covering those eastern approaches to Murfreesboro, to attack and take that hill. Bragg needs to get the victory he's already announced, and to do so, he must take the high ground. Breckinridge's 4,400 men will load one round and fixed bayonets. Their artillery will open up and engage the 57 Union cannons that are lined up along the west bank of the Stones River, trying to distract them. And then the Confederates will emerge, run as fast as they can across about a half mile of open field. They will reach the base of the hill that the Yankees have. They will exchange a, a firing with the enemy and then they will charge, screaming the rebel yell up the hill. And in fact, they will drive the Union troops right up over the top of the hill, and that'll be the end of it. Or they think, they've taken the hill. And now there goes the enemy down towards the river. Well, good military doctrine says, if you got them on the run, keep them on the run. And so the Confederates start down the slope of the hill towards the Swollen Stones River. And that's when the Union artillery, having dispatched its Confederate counterparts, has now turned all 57 of those cannons on the mass of gray coming down towards the river. They open fire, and about 30 minutes later, more than 1,800 Confederate soldiers lie dead or wounded along the banks of the Stones River. 
Well, needless to say, that blunts the Confederate attack. Union forces will surge back across the river, drive the remaining Confederates back to their starting point at Waynes Hill, and the Battle of Stones River comes to a close with both armies essentially occupying the same ground they had the day before. But now the Union has about twice as many men on the east bank of the Stones River as Breckenridge has, and his guys are beaten. All Rosecrans has to do is go back to his original attack plan, push through what's left of Breckenridge's division, get into Murfreesboro, cut off the Confederate retreat route, and he's right where he wanted to be back on the morning of December 31st, 1862. The Union Army moves into Murfreesboro on January 5th, and they declare victory. Lincoln gets his victory, and it hits the papers and bolsters Northern morale at a time that it's needed most. It helps support that Emancipation Proclamation and now sets this war into one that not is one simply to restore the Union, but one that will remake us as a nation. Above all, the sturdy rank and file showed invincible fighting courage and stamina, worthy of a great and free nation. General William Rosecrans. When it's all over and the Union Army starts going out to do the burying and try to deal with this, the wounded, they will find when the final tally is done that nearly 24,000 of the 81,000 soldiers that fought here ended up as casualties, either killed, wounded, or captured. I can never forget, whilst I remember anything, that about the end of last year and the beginning of this, you gave us a hard-earned victory, which, had there been a defeat instead, the nation could scarcely have lived over. President Abraham Lincoln. Following the end of the Civil War, both Confederate and Union veterans would hold reunions over the years due to the battle's significance in their lives. 25 years after the war, Congress established the first national battlefield at Chickamauga. More battlefields would follow, including the Stones River National Battlefield. Under the wing of the National Park Service, the battlefield entertains hundreds of thousands of visitors each year. Next to the battlefield is the Stones River National Cemetery, where thousands of soldiers, mostly Union, are buried. The cemetery itself is the admiration of all who visit it, being located on a beautiful knoll directly in the center of the immortal fields of Stones River. Well, may it be said that this spot was bought by the blood of our countrymen, and here it is most fitting that their scattered bones should be collected and treasured. Chaplain William Earnshaw. While it sees so many visitors annually, the Stones River National Battlefield also maintains strong ties to the city in which this great battle was fought. Reaching out to the community here in Murfreesboro adjacent to the park is absolutely critical. We want folks to feel like this park is their park. Coming to learn about the history is certainly important, taking advantage of ranger activities, but visitors also have an opportunity to come and enjoy a hike, a walk, riding their bicycle, jogging, walking their dog, looking for those beautiful wildflowers and the incredible numbers of birds that we've got. We have an opportunity to go out to a variety of different community groups, whether it's the uh, Boys and Girls Club, whether it's the Rotaries, whether it's uh, um, the community, the chamber organizations, and help them understand the breadth and depth of the experience that visitors can have here in their own backyard. The Stones River National Battlefield offers numerous exhibits, interpretive programs, scenic stops, and the opportunity to reflect on the vital role and impact this battle had during the course of the Civil War. Stone Drifford National Battlefield is very important as you look at the context of the Civil War. And it's important that visitors come and understand its role in that very historic conflict that we had as a country. Well, it's important for us to be here and telling this story to visitors who come from all over the country and in fact all over the world to kind of delve into this story, not just of the Battle of Stones River, but of our American Civil War. Because, you know, Civil Wars are not unusual, sad to say. But our Civil War is unique in a lot of ways because we still, when we talk about ourselves as a nation, 
A lot of what we look back to as what makes us uniquely American comes from the Civil War. I think uh, national parks and Stones River National Battlefield are important for the American people in that they, they provide a place where we can actually walk on the ground where significant events occurred in our history. We can gain a deeper understanding of, of our country's past, of who we are today, and maybe have a sense of how this can help us move into the future. Uh, Stones River, the Battle of Stones River was a major Civil War battle had a significant impact on the outcome of the Civil War and uh, really helped shape who we are as a people today. We just want to really reach out and provide an active invitation for visitors to come and visit us. You can visit our website at www.mps.gov STRI. Call the office here at 615-893 9501. Come early and come often and learn our part of your history. Come see us at Stones River National Battlefield.